Well, I barely have to cover anything on this slide now. It's all been covered already. So remember what he said. Um, yeah, so I've been in, involved in the world of security for 25 years at this point. And so I've had a chance to do a lot of different things on that journey. Um, as was mentioned, from working at Cisco to starting my own company to selling it to kind of figuring out what's next for me right now. Um, another plug for the AppSec podcast and the security table. I'm seeing some people in the room that have been on the AppSec podcast, so it's always great when it comes around full circle. I'm a big fan of, uh, continue to be a big fan of Twitter, so feel free to reach out to me there. Um, here's what I want to use my time with you uh, today to discuss and kind of explore. Uh, I want to talk about this idea of DevSecOps culture. So I'm going to, I'm going to take us out of the, the bits and bytes of the pipelines and things and raise us up a little bit higher. Because as I've studied DevSecOps and I've just noticed there's a number of, of things, there's a little bit of humor in it too, but there's a number of things that, that can be detrimental to making DevOps a success. And I just want to point those things out and share some context and some insights about it. So that's what I call the 10 failures in DevSecOps. I'll share each one of those failures, and then I'll give you some thoughts from my perspective about what you can do to be more successful. Like, how can you, how can you eliminate this particular failure? And then I'll leave some time for conclusion and q and I'm also aware that lunch is the next thing on the agenda, so don't, but I'm, I'm not up here going, I got two hours to talk. I, I'm aware I'm watching the clock, too. So do, do a little thought experiment with me here. Okay, imagine we're going to get in a time machine, and we're going to travel 50 years into the future. We're going to look up a page on Wikipedia. We're going to see what it says about DevOps and DevSecOps. Also, by the way, I'm from the generation that if we tra travel in time, we use a DeLorean. We go 88 miles an hour. That's my thing. If you're the hot tub time machine or some other thing, you can feel free to use that too. But imagine that Wikipedia entry. We're looking at it. We're, we're trying to understand what's happened with DevOps over the last 50 years. The question I have for you is, is DevOps still going to be relevant then? 50 years from now in the future. If we look at history a little bit, Waterfall, I didn't know this until, until somebody explained it to me, but Waterfall started in 1956, and it's still used in, in some pockets of the world today. They're still doing Waterfall-based development. The Agile Manifesto came out in 2001. Agile is alive and well as we know it. We think of DevOps as starting in 2009, still going strong. And so when I think about 50 years from now, I think DevOps is still going to exist. I just think it's going to be the cultural pieces that still exist. The tools, the technologies, those things will long have been replaced by, by newer and, and better technologies. But the cultural pieces of this is what can still exist. And so when I think about the DevSecOps cultural drivers, there's a, there's a few different things that I think play into this. And so it starts with knowledge. What's our, what's our knowledge of, of what we're building? Knowledge of, of the different teams that, are, that, that we're working with. What's the experience that these folks have in building software? But there's also an art and a science that comes into to doing DevOps, to building software well, as well as a side for creativity and ultimately growth. And so when I think about this idea of a DevSecOps culture, it's really, it is a living and breathing thing. It's something that, that can slow down. It's something that can, can, can you know, introduce additional challenges. So I looked at uh, GitLab put out a report here in 2022, Global DevSecOps Survey, and they asked developers, what are the most challenging parts of your role? As you might imagine, security, security, security was given by more than a 1,000 of those respondents. So we, we know we're in the right problem space here. We know, we know that, this, that this integration of security is an issue. Some of the other answers they came up with, keep it secure, keep it updated, building applications that are secure, data security, I repeat, data security. This is all good stuff, though, because what this reinstills for us as developers, as builders, as those that are trying to influence these people is developers are not against what we're trying to do. Like I, I, mean, like I said, I've been in security for 25 years. I remember a time when people, when, when security was not very welcome at the table, when, when there was pushback. But what we're seeing now is at the developer level, they realize what we have to do. And so what do we, when we think about a happy DevOps culture, just, just kind of circling back on this idea of DevOps, these are things that we've talked about for a long time. I mean, it's, it's automation, it's lack of friction, it's having blameless retrospectives. That's probably one of the most important ones. And, you know, if you're a security person here like me, that's my, one of the ones that we often struggle with the most is being able to do a retrospective without pointing the finger at anybody but saying we're all going to learn from it and move forward. 
But also making that happy culture is transparency. Another one, I mean, for me as a security person, not a big fan of transparency. You know, sometimes I like to, you know, what about need to know? <laughs> Don't we have a need to know on this? No. We need to be more transparent. We need to be more open and, and let other people understand what's, what's driving our decisions. But also cl collaboration, triumvirate of trust. You know, all of these things get worked together to be a happy DevOps culture. And before we go any further, let's talk for a second about what is culture. Because we'll probably all agree that it's important to have a strong security culture for how we build software. But what, what really is culture? I, I had to study far and wide to try to understand this because it's a, it's a topic that's much wider than security in general. But the, the definition that I've landed on that, that I've come to love is security culture is what happens with security when people are left to make their own decisions. And uh, let me give you an example so you understand what I'm talking about here. It's Friday afternoon. It's 4 o'clock. A developer's been working on something all week long. It's, it's, it's due on Friday. They get a particular security issue. They, they find a security issue. One of the tools kicks off an issue or something. It's 4 o'clock. They promised the boss they were going to get this, this thing pushed to production. It's got to be done. Your security culture is defined by what happens in that moment. If that developer pushes to production and says, we have to move forward, we have to do, we have to do, we have to move forward, we can't, we can't stop because we made this commitment. And I would argue that's a weak security culture. But if that developer can, sit, can hit the brakes and say, you know what, we're not going to production, there's an issue here, and we're going to revise it next week. That's a really strong security culture. But, but you really have to be in that example to understand this idea of security culture at a greater depth. So yeah, I have to have one inspirational quote per talk. It's, I don't know, it was in the speaker agreement or something, I don't know. But this is mine. If we are to preserve culture, we must continue to create it. And that, that really made me think about, also think more deeply about this idea of DevSecOps culture. Like, if we're gonna, if we're gonna preserve it and make it better as we go forward, we have to continue to create it and change it and, and, and see it grow. So let's, let's, before we jump into the failures, let's, let's get, let's work on the name here for a second. Okay? I'm not, I'm someone who's not been a big fan of DevSecOps as a name. Okay? Show of hands. Who, who, who thought DevSecOps was a bad idea having a separate name? Oh, we get about 100% of the room. It's rounding error or something, but pretty close to 100%. The reason is, really, DevOps is how we build software. And we decided we were going to add SEC into it to create this other thing, this other cottage industry. But at the end of the day, what, what, what should DevOps mean? DevOps should mean building secure software fast, quickly, however we want to define it there. We don't need to call out security separately in that. And it's, it's, it's kind of been one of these issues that's been kicking around for a long time, and I used to think of it as a failure. Now I'm just addressing it up front. But I think we just need to refer to this thing as DevOps. We just, we just need, to, we need to ensure security is built into it, but we just, we, let's just start calling it DevOps. Okay, so here's my 10 failures that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a little bit of time walking through and exploring each one. But I wanted to give you kind of a broad view of where we're going here um, so you kind of have the roadmap. We'll start with the infinity graph, make our way all the way down to vulnerable code landing in the wild. But we're going to explore each of these, hopefully with a little bit of fun. So failure number one for me is the infinity graph. I hate the infinity graph. If it truly is an infinity graph, we never push any software because it would just continually go around. There'd be no delivery coming out of it. I, I just I, I dislike this as a way to describe or define how DevOps is working. And it, the funny thing is, if you watch like any webinar that has anything to do with DevOps, slide two or three will be the infinity graph. And this is DevOps. Everyone must understand it. I think there's a better way. Leave the infinity to the experts here. And I think pipelines are really the way to think about this. I think it just makes more sense for people to understand it. And for me, I don't want to build something that half the people that are supposed to be using it don't understand how it works or how it comes together. And so I think pipelines, not infinity graphs, are really the answer. And so for me, when I think about a DevOps pipeline, you notice I've got that plan and design line there that I'm showing in green. Because there are things like security best practices and threat modeling, they don't fit in the pipeline. 
They're, they're, they're not a tool that's running that's, that's somehow implementing security best practices or performing threat modeling. So I, I'm fine to show that as a, something that sits above this pipeline. But I mean, all the things you see here, there shouldn't be any surprises in, in what I think of in, in, in the individual categories of the pipeline from, you know, code reviews and software composition analysis to SAS and DAST and testing and secrets injection and scanning and red teaming and even security chaos engineering thrown in there in the, in the kind of deploy phase. But really, I think the answer for what we need to do here is we need to throw out the infinity graphs and just focus on pipelines. So here's a, here's a tool um, from a gentleman by the name of DJ Schleen who's done a lot of, uh, a lot of work in DevOps and security and the integration. Um, I'm going to show you another project he did a little bit later, but which will, um, th that he, he, he kind of mapped out the de whole DevSecOps pipeline at different levels of abstraction. But when we think about building pipelines, he released the tool set that he used, the templates, to be able to create your own pipelines. Now, this is, I didn't use that here. This is a PowerPoint drawing. But he created this template for draw.io that you can use to very easily create all the shapes and things of a really nice pipeline diagram. So you can create something that integrates all your security tools as, as, a, as something you can make available to help your engineering teams understand how does security integrate into what we're doing, how we're building software here. So that's called the DevSecOps architecture tools. And um, I will make sure the slides are available at the end. So um, if you want to grab any of those uh, links and whatnot. Okay, so we dealt with the infinity graph. Let's talk about failure number two, security as a special team. And really, you know, the opposite of the security team is the insecurity team. And for this, I don't know, this may be a little bit of my history kind of playing into this as far as because I, I grew up in security when we were a special team, we were special, and we would show up at meetings and say, well, you have to do that because we're the security team. <laughs> of course you're going to have to do that. And that's why I call this a failure, <laughs> because where we live now, where we build software today, that's, that just doesn't work. I can't show up and say, well, I'm from security, we have to do it this way. We, we have to be more collaborative. We have to, we have to participate in the process and, and be developers ourselves to some degree. And so I think the answer to this one, to this second failure, is really the fact that security and coding, they're for everyone. And when we look at another, another chart I pulled out of GitLab's uh, 2022 Global DevSecOps Survey, how responsible do you feel for application security in your organization? Um, this was asked to developers. Completely responsible, 40, you know, 3% or whatever. Somewhat, as part of a bigger team, everyone, 53%. So, and then the other two, you know, I do my part, but someone else owns it, 3%, not responsible, 1%. So, like, the people who are saying security is not my problem, it's a very small group of people at this stage. Mostly everybody's saying, yes, security is for everyone. And so I think there's a few things that we can do as security people to be better prepared to help those developers, to work with them. We know, like I said, that they want to be responsible for security. And the, for them to be responsible requires us to transfer some knowledge that we have and also help them to get some experience. And so one of the things I think we can do is, is starting with foundational understanding of security, application security principles, it seems like such a simple thing to say. Foundational pieces of knowledge about application security. But what I found in my travels is developers don't know enough about the foundations. They don't know as, as much as about, about them as I thought they did. And, and the more I go into companies and the more I talk to different people and say, there is a need for a foundational layer. And that's something that can help to prepare them to be able to do bigger and bigger things. But if you don't understand the basics, of application security, then you're going to struggle to be able to apply secure coding principles in Java or React or whatever, Python, whatever your programming language is of choice. You have to understand what authentication is, what authorization, how access control works, what are the different types of access control. Before we throw somebody in, into, the, into the corner and say, uh, build an access control system. But we never told you, we never taught you what the foundational pieces of it were. We just said, go figure it out. That's why I think we, need, we have that need for foundational pieces there. The last one, security, we need to know how to code. If we're uh, application security people and we can't program in a single language, then we need to get to work. We got work to, to do. Because when you sit down across from a developer, they can tell in about 10 seconds whether you know the language that, or have some knowledge of the language that they're using and that you're going to advise them on. 
And if you start, if, if you kind of, if they figure out that you don't really understand the language, then you've kind of discounted yourself in that process. And don't get me wrong, I am not, I don't even know, I'm probably, scale of one to 10 as a developer, I'm probably lucky to be a two or a three. But I understand object oriented programming principles. I understand so that I can apply that to different things. I spent time learning Java a long, long time ago, but I've done things with Ruby recently. But it, it enables me to be able to understand what the developer's challenge is and then to be able to advise them with some knowledge of how software works versus just saying, well, this is what the proactive controls from OWASP say. I can, I can say, you know, here's why we need to encode data on output or, or do input validation because I have, I have, a, have the context now. But we got to be there. We got to be at the table understanding those things with them. Okay. Failure number three is what I'm calling vendor defined DevOps. It's my cloud and my DevOps says the vendor. What I've seen is, especially with the cloud providers, I've seen this trend where they define what DevOps is in their context. And then that's what they reflect back to you. And I'm not picking on any cloud provider. I've seen it across all of them, whether it's AWS, Azure, GCP, whoever. They have their version of DevOps. You can buy DevOps in a box from them. But it tends to be their approach to how they think it should be handled, how it should be done. And so my challenge here when it comes to the vendors telling you what DevOps is and how security fits into it, Embrace the reality of your DevOps. Like, just because they're saying, well, you, you know, you use Azure, so this is, this is Dev, how, how we do Azure DevOps, doesn't necessarily mean that's the best way for you to build software or to integrate security into the pipelines that you have. And so, you know, don't let them define it and, and look for kind of a bigger contextual reality of, of how you can do a vendor independent DevOps. I mean, you might want to change cloud providers at some point in the future. If you're locked into their specific DevOps way with their security tools plugged in, it's just another thing. Um, and there's so much innovation that's happening in this space, so many excellent tools that you can put together. You don't have to fall back to, this is how Azure says we have to do it, and, and we're, we're, we're constrained by their approach. Okay, failure number four is what I'm calling big company envy. And so what if I told you that Etsy, Netflix, and Facebook have been doing DevOps for years? How many times have you heard somebody say that, well, you know, we've been at DevOps for a year and, you know, we should be able to deploy 50 times an hour because Facebook deploys 50 times an hour or Etsy does it and they have all their security tools fully integrated and everything. Yes, they do. And they've been working at this for 10 plus years now. And so the message here is it's okay to, to embrace DevOps and not be at the same level as those that have been doing it for 10 plus years in the first year of rolling this out. It is an incremental progression to having a mature DevOps pipeline that has all these security tools. It's a tool here, a tool there. And it, it comes down to it kind of figuring out what, it, where are we today? And then where do we want to go in the future? Luckily, OWASP has another project that does this specifically for DevSecOps. DevSecOps maturity model will help you to create a roadmap. And so Timo Pagel is the, uh, the project lead for this particular effort. So if you haven't seen, how many people have, have used uh, DevSecOps maturity model before? Okay, just a, yeah, maybe just a small group of folks. So everybody else, check it out. It's a lot of thought and research has gone into creating and, and, and breaking down the different functional areas of DevSecOps and then creating different levels, just like SAM. I mean, Timo, Timo took the SAM kind of approach and said, how can we do this specifically for DevSecOps? So it's a very deep project. Um, like a lot of things in OWASP, it's, it's not as front and center as some of the bigger projects, but there's a lot of, lot of value here. You can really use this to roadmap where you need to get to in the future. And, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're sitting there thinking, I don't really know what the next things are that we need to do to, to make our pipelines better, this is, this is the project that defines it. So they did an excellent job with it. I'm a big fan. Okay, failure number five. I'm going to call it marketing term infatuation. This is the shift left, shift right, just start. So the funny thing for me is when I think about, like, we have shift left, shift right, we have start left, start right. Um, someone tried to tell me there was a middle, there was a center. I don't know what, I don't know how that was fitting into the illustration. But, you know, when you start to think about start left and start right, like, wait a minute, now we're talking about secure development lifecycle again. 
That's what we were talking about 15 years ago to get this whole thing rolling. So um, what's old is new and things start to come and go and come back around again. That's okay. Um, but really, I mean, we all know security front, right, left, and center, like, you know, shift left. You know, I'm somebody who's I'm not going to pick on any particular piece of this. I think all of these things have to work together, though. Shift left, of course, we want things closer. We all, No one's going to sit here and tell me that you want security at the end of the process. We're way past those days. But then when I think about shifting or starting right, you know, I think runtime application self-protection is one of the best inventions of the last number of years. And as it's, it starts to mature, and, you know, I don't have a particular tool or, or technology provider that I'm going to say, go look at everybody that's out there. Go walk the show floor and see who's here doing this. But the maturity that's starting to come into those products of having an agent that runs inside the application that's watching for SQL injection. And the beautiful thing about RASP is it really has no false positives because if the SQL injection is detected inside the running application, it's almost 100% sure that, that there's, an, there's an actual attack underway there. So I think the maturity of those, those types of products really does help to drag us uh, even, even further forward. Uh, but let's meet in the middle. Let's do all these things and call it Secure Development Lifecycle. It'll make me happy. I, I love SDL. Okay, failure number six, overcomplicated pipelines and doing everything now. Okay, does anybody want to come up here and just explain this real quick? I never get a volunteer for that. Oh, is that a hand right there? No, he just, yeah, he wasn't. It was, it's like, nope, it wasn't. <laughs> It is, it is. I use this picture just to kind of get that effect. It actually is a pretty easy picture. Um, this is another thing that DJ Schleen put together. Um, it's the DevSecOps reference architecture. He did it in 2020, so it's a little bit dated, but the cool, I think you can still download it from Sonotype though. Um, and what the cool thing is, it's a draw.io file. He used this to build those templates that I was talking, telling you about at the very beginning. So you can, you can create documents like this, no, you're not as complex, to model your own pipelines, to share that with your engineering teams. But the cool thing about this is you can, you can go into draw.io and start to hide layers. So you can, bake, you can basically bring this thing down until it's just the pipelines, and then you add one layer at a time, and it'll, it'll, you'll start to, you can understand it at the, you know, you can look at it at the, at the 50,000 foot view, the 40,000, 30,000, until you start getting close to the ground. Once you, once you've seen it from those other abstract levels, it, it makes a lot more sense and you can zoom in and see the different things. But, um, so I actually do love this, but it does make a point about overcomplicated pipelines. So, you know, I'm somebody who's, who, who starts simple, lives simply. I think that's the way we have to approach anything we do in security. Like, if we make it complex, then, you know, in my mind, I won't even be able to understand what it is we're trying to accomplish. How can I ask other people to do that as well? And so, you know, there's a lot of different security tools out there. Um, starting with a small subset, especially if you're getting into DevOps and, and applying uh, security tooling, you're early in that journey, you know, keeping it simple and, you know, just starting with one tool or two tools versus trying to embed everything you can think of in the security space, it just makes it easier for your developers to be able to absorb and to get some high fidelity results to come out of that. And so, you know, the, the pipeline should be simple enough that everybody that's working on it can explain it, both you as security professionals and every developer that's working in it. You should be able to show them a picture. They should be able to explain what's happening in this pipeline. If they can't, you've made it too complicated. You need to simplify it back and, and give them something that they can work from there. And you're not going to solve everything immediately. Like we can, we can go into this saying we want to have that dream of fixing all the problems, you know, right from the very beginning. But let's just be realists and say this is going to be a journey. It's good. You're going to get better as you use DevSecOps maturity model to, to profile where you are. You start adding more and more pieces. You're going to get better. You can't do it in a week. You can't do it in a month. You can't do it in a quarter. You have to make a progression over time and, and try to do that as simply as possible. So failure number six is security as gatekeeper. And so when I think about gatekeeping, for me, it's really, you know, adding those, trying to add manual checkpoints to an automated process is like the ultimate sin of, of gatekeeping. Because what does DevOps want to do? We want to move a million miles an hour. What does is, what is a manual step involved in it do? We're going, to, we're going to slow everything down and stop it. And so, um, you know, as security folks, we can't be gatekeepers in this process. We have to enable the development teams, the engineering teams, and the business to move at a faster speed. 
So somebody challenged me with, with this statement, and I've adopted it, and I've shared it with lots of security professionals all over the world. This idea of drop the no, try yes if. Because I always used to use a but in that, in that example. I'd always say, well, yes, but... And da, 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 here's all the security problems you have. And somebody challenged me and said, you know, you don't have to say it that way. You can say, you know, yes, if. And I thought, well, that's a really just a, it's a very small nuance in, in my thinking, but it's not me putting up my hands and saying, this is a, th you can't do that because that's bad for security. It's me saying, that's a, it's me acknowledging, yes, this is a really innovative idea you have as a developer. If we add these other things to help make it more secure and protect the privacy of the data that we're collecting and the integrity of the systems and whatnot, it just changes the, changes the picture a little bit. So empathy, not a word you hear at security conferences that much, maybe not enough. Empathy is this idea of we as security people should really understand what our developers are dealing with. And so has anybody here ever spent one to three days sitting next to a developer in your organization and just watching and asking questions? Okay, a few people. What, was, it a powerful, was it a powerful result for you? Did you learn a lot about development? Yeah, okay, got it. Yeah. Yeah, so you've lived it. Yeah. 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 So yeah, you've lived it. You've lived the experience of it though. And, and so what, what I want to challenge you though, is if you haven't done this, go sp just spend a day. You might even do it virtually. Watch the developers use the tools that you add to the pipeline. <laughs> Watch what happens. Cause you're, I, I promise you at some point during the day, you'll go like, why are you doing that? Oh, well, this is what we have to do to kind of work around this thing that your tool spits out. And we have to do this and that to really make it effective. Your, your eyes are going to be open to some things that you just won't see if we sit in our, you know, our security ivory tower or whatever. Get down and, and spend some time with those developers and understand how they use the tools and the things that you have. Same thing goes for operations and security, developers and operations. Like everybody should have an, a, good, a better understanding and, and have empathy for how, for, for what other people are doing in the process. Cause then we start to break down the roadblocks that we have there. Another thing you can think about is security coaches. So this is an idea that was introduced to me. Uh, I was doing a podcast interview and somebody was started talking about the, it was a large financial in the U.S. Um, they were talking about their security coaching program. And they went so far as to add team members to the application security team whose sole role was security coach. And the, he described them as a life coach for application security. And what they would do is they would go around and spend time with different developers, one-on-one, -on -one, two to one, three to one, like smaller groupings, and just coach them through being more security aware. And then after a week or two, they would parachute off to <laughs> some other group somewhere, still maintaining the relationship and the contacts. So if somebody had needed additional help along the way, they could get back to them. But I think that was just a really powerful middle ground when we think about like security champions are getting so much attention. Security coaches is just another, it's a piece almost between the champions and the security team where it's, they're more involved with the development teams, but they're also a more of a dedicated resource from the, the perspective of the, of the security team. Okay. So we're almost at the top here, but we're at number eight, noisy security tools as a failure. Um, I don't know. I just got this view. Like, imagine if, if Gordon Ramsay was, was part of your operations team. Like, first of all, would he wear the chef's jacket? I don't probably. But would he scream at you and call us an idiot sandwich or something because of something that we changed in the pipeline or whatever? But um, we know noisy security tools can be a big challenge. And one of the things that we can do from, from a culture perspective is, first of all, you know, tuning any tools that we have in our pipeline. We, we also have to keep this idea that we're never going to waste anybody's time with findings that don't matter. And so if we make that a core principle of our, of our approach to adding tooling, that we will never waste anyone's time with a tool that, that 
you know, provides garbage results, then we can set ourselves up and our developers up for a lot more success. And then the other thing to think about with new tools is when you roll, when people roll out new tools, it seems like they always do the same thing. They take that tool and what do you do? Well, I paid, uh, let's see, there's a comma in the middle. I paid this much money for my site license. The tool has 20 different things it can do. Better turn on all 20 because we paid all this money for the tool. We got to let this thing rip. We got to get our return on investment. So we can send a, a chart up to the executives that shows return on investment, 100. Well, 100 of what? I'm not sure. But the point here, though, is what do we do when we turn on all 20 things in a new tool? We light the developers up with findings when we initially run those tools or make them part of pipelines. And so by going into taking a more strategic approach to how you include new tools is something that can be very powerful. Using a minimal policy to, to launch a new tool should be the goal of what we, what, what we do. Because what we want to do is ensure that those developers are getting results of the highest fidelity coming out of that tool. Because if a developer gets dumped with 100 tickets and all of them are garbage from your new tool, what's their opinion of the tool? What do they tell everybody at lunch about the tool? Oh, this tool, this the security just added is garbage. It created 100 tickets for me that were nothing to do with anything in reality. But if we go with a minimal policy and we get them some high fidelity results the first time they run those tools, then they're going to be like, ah, that tool was okay. Which, in, you know, in speaking in development, that meant they loved it 110 out of 10. That was their favorite thing. All right, failure number nine, lack of threat modeling. Okay, so people will say DevOps is too quick for threat modeling. Thousands of business logic flaws beg to differ. You can say that DevOps is, is a fast way of delivering software and threat modeling is something that you can't do at the same speed, but business logic issues in the code that our developers write tell us that we have to have some way to deal with threat modeling in the, in the DevOps process. And so for me, de uh, threat modeling happens outside the scope of the pipeline because we are going to have, doesn't matter what development methodology you use, I don't care. You have some step where a developer gets a ticket, a story, um, an idea. I don't know what other ones it would be, but there, there is a, an assignment step where somebody is handed a given task to do, no matter what methodology you use. That's where I want us to, that's where threat modeling should be connected. And if you use Jira to do uh, your, your user story tracking, then your threat modeling results should be embedded in Jira. We shouldn't be taking developers and saying, you got to go to this other system that you never use for anything other than recording threat modeling results. Help the developers operate kind of where they, you know, help them use threat modeling within the scope of where they operate today. Don't give them a bunch of new, new places they have to go. Got to do a plug for the threat modeling manifesto. Um, if, if you're new to threat modeling or trying to figure out how it could fit into the DevOps environment, we certainly in the manifesto, it doesn't address DevOps specifically, but this is a great resource and a great place to start. Um, it's threatmodelingmanifesto.org, available for everybody. So I think failure number 10, vulnerable code in the wild, probably the most simple of all the ones that I described here. Um, you know, we all know at this stage the implications of the software supply chain. We've, we've learned a lot more this year about the terror, I guess we should call it the terror of the software supply chain, um, you know, from attackers modifying components that then get pushed up into our, pro our applications, from attackers going after build pipelines and, and compromising them directly. I mean, you've got the top 10 CICD risks, another new project you should take a look at if you haven't seen. Um, that's a, that's, it's an excellent, uh, understanding of how attackers these days are going after pipelines and what are the, what are the things that you need to be mitigating against. But, you know, vulnerable code in the wild is still a big part of what we, what we struggle with here. And so, you know, I think software composition analysis, it almost seems like it's a no brainer at this point. So if you're not, if you haven't integrated something and we have so many awesome tools in the OWASP universe for SCA, you know, you've got dependency check, you've got dependency track. Um, you've got all the SBOM work that's happening. Steve Springett and many others in the OWASP universe are, are putting forth a lot of effort. Jeremy Long with the, with dependency check. So, uh, you've got a lot of tools. It doesn't necessarily have to be a commercial tool. There are open source alternatives here that are, you know, you could argue dependency check and dependency track are on par with a lot of the commercial tools that are out there. You know, I always, whenever I see Jeremy or Steve, and you should do this as well, I thank them because 
<laughs> they, they they built some things inside of OWASP that they could have made a lot of money on if they would have wanted to go start big companies and run with it. But they have a passion for the open source community and for getting those tools out far and wide. And so whenever you see them, please thank them as well. So yeah, I just put all those successes here together. So let's just kind of wrap these things up. You know, not focus as much on the failures, but focus on what are the successes that we have here. And so it starts with pipelines and not infinity graphs. You know, security is really for everybody. Focus on the your DevOps. Don't worry about what the vendors say DevOps should look like in your world. Like, you know, you just you define DevOps and you you know protect that standard that you set up. You gotta be content with your own DevOps. I don't care what Facebook or Etsy's doing or Amazon, how many millions of times they can push pr to production a day. You know, focus on what you can do. And then we talked about security being front, right, left, and center. Ultimately, secure development lifecycle is how we can, we can once again wrap these things all together. We talked about keeping the pipeline simple. Security, we got to be trusted partners. We got to tune the tools. I'm a big proponent of threat modeling really being for everyone and, and being a big part of how we build software. And then software supply chain and, and the overall risks there, you know, come down to, to bringing all those things together. So yeah, think about what's the impact of DevOps 50 years from now. You know, it's going to be on the security culture. I'm convinced it's not going to be, it's not going to be the tools. The tools will be long gone. It'll be new generations of them. We talked about some of the failures that are kind of outside of our control, you know, like the use of infinity grass, but you can change it in your own world. You can, you can focus on using pipelines and things that are easily, easily understandable. And then, you know, security and coding, these are for everybody, embracing your DevOps, threat modeling, all those things. And I guess my last thing is just embrace and laugh at the failures. You know, it's, it's okay to, to laugh at this as long as we learn from it. We go through that blameless retrospective. We make improvements to our pipelines. We ultimately make them more secure. Um, quick plug for the Threat Modeling Connect is a uh, open threat modeling community that I had a chance to be a part of from the beginning here. Um, there's, there's a booth here you can check out. But what, what we're trying to do is, is really have a community place where people can come in and, and, and learn and grow in the field of threat modeling. So um, stop. there's a booth out there for it as well. And with that, I will open the floor to questions, comments, maybe even concerns. Uh, two parts of questions. First of all, lots of great ideas, so thank you for that. Uh, second question, I've got a globally distributed set of developers all over the world, and uh, because of the pandemic, we sent them all home when they're still there, and they're not coming back. We give away our offices. So, two-part question. One, how do you create change? Second question, how do you create cultural change? Thank you. Okay, so yeah, those are, those are definitely... Great questions and they're big challenges. I think a lot of people are dealing with how do we how do we get the in the remote environments. Um, I think you know I think we got to just we got to spend more time as security people looking for avenues to directly collaborate with people. And so I think we've got this idea that everybody's at home, so we can't do things like workshops, for example. One of the things I've had a lot of success with is doing virtual workshops. And these are virtual workshops where I'm teaching a particular application security topic and everybody's engaged. Okay, so if it's like if you're doing one of these workshops, anybody turns their video off, uh -uh. no, because I know what you're doing. Like you're walking your dog or something. I know, I know, I know the game. Right? But by ha by having things where it's instructional and it's it's interactive and they're doing things, like what we don't need is more Zoom calls where I'm doing a 45 minute lecture and everybody's doing something else. We have to be, we have to embrace the tools and technology we have um, and be able to get people active in it though. So you can't, we're so, remote is so easy to be one directional where it's just I'm broadcasting out or everybody's listening and we know that nobody's getting anything out of that. So you gotta find ways to do things that are interactive where there's small teams, you know what, I, I'll make Zoom sessions, I'll then break people off into breakout rooms with four people and let them chew on something and tell them if somebody's not talking, <laughs> Call on them, you know, bring everybody into the conversation. So that's just, that's one idea for money. Yeah. I've got a question over here. Have you any advice for teams, um, security teams that are expected to be generalists, but still support AppSec as one pillar? So you mm -hmm. spoke about being an expert or anything, but you can't take somebody from an IT background and say, hey, I need to make you a developer as well. 
Yeah, that's that's a that's a good uh, good question and and uh, not one that I've thought a whole lot about as far as kind of bringing generalists back into um, mo most of the teams I encounter today have some facet of AppSec kind of peeled off. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big education person, so I think pouring into those folks like. Even if they are generalists, if they're going to work with developers, figuring out like what are some things, you know, we've got so many things in the OWASP world alone that you can get people into. You know, if I think about something like Juice Shop, you know, it's a hands on interactive experience and it costs zero dollars to, to use it. And so I, I would look for opportunities to provide some structure for people. Hopefully, some of those generalists have a small spark of passion to want to learn and, and grow and become, you know, more better in different areas of security they don't have experience in. Um, but that's what I would be pushing them for is, is challenging them to say, Hey, you're going to work with developers. So here's, here, here's a pathway for you. A lot of times that's what people need too. If you tell someone you need to learn more about AppSec, or they go to Google, put in AppSec. <laughs> what comes up first? I don't even know what comes up, but um, if you give them some a pathway to say, you know, here's some things you can do to increase your experience. I think you'll, I think those generalists will, they'll be able to at least navigate the world of development better. Got another one down here in front. Hi. Um, first of all, I love those points and all that. I have a question. I think it was number eight when you said, don't show anything that is not exploitable, I guess, or in, in your words. But then in number 10, you said break on SCA findings. And we all know that SCA findings are a lot of non-exploitable because it's an issue that is that I'm not using in my application. So yeah, and I think I mean, I think you've uncovered a I mean, exploitability is a big issue right now. And I, I, I feel like we're still trying to get our arms wrapped around it. From a from a tooling perspective, it is definitely something that we should factor in here into the future. Um, I'm when I'm thinking about SCA and, and you know, filtering and whatnot, I'm thinking much more generically than that. But yeah, you're, you're, you're kind of refining the point. And I agree with you. Exploitability is something that needs to be factored in better into the future. I don't know that we're, that I don't know that the tools are 100% ready for us to trust them today to say, eh, tool said it wasn't exploitable. We're good to go. But I think we're going to get there. I think, I think that's where the tools are going. So yeah, I think that, that's a great point though. That's a, that's a place where, you know, th my, my thinking will likely refine as, as the tooling gets better. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank